Welcome to Music History Monday for January 22nd, 2024. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Johannes Brahms, Piano Concerto No. 1. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash robertgreenbergmusic, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the premiere on January 22, 1859, 165 years ago today, of Johannes Brahms's Piano Concerto No. 1 in the German city of Hanover. No other work by Brahms caused him such effort, never before or after, did he so agonize over a piece, working and reworking it over and over again. Background. On October 1st, 1853, the 20-year-old Johannes Brahms showed up at the door of Robert and Clara Schumann's house in Dusseldorf in the Rhineland. At the time, Brahms was pretty much a complete unknown outside of his hometown of Hamburg. He was visiting the Schumanns at the behest of the violinist and conductor Josef Joachim, 1831-1907, who, although only two years older than Brahms, was already world famous. Physically, the young Brahms looked virtually nothing like the bearded, portly, cigar-smoking, bear-like dude of his later years. At 20, he was described as being, quote, a shy, awkward, nearsighted young man, blonde, delicate, almost wispy, boyish in appearance as well as in manner. The beard was still 22 years away and with a voice whose high pitch was a constant embarrassment to him." Unquote. This 20-year-old kid might not have looked like our familiar image of Brahms, but his extraordinary talents as a composer and pianist were already there and in spades. He performed some of his early music for Robert and Clara, and they were, very simply, gobsmacked. That evening, Clara wrote in her journal, quote, Here is one who comes as if sent from God. He played us sonatas and scherzos of his own, all of them rich in fantasy, depth of feeling, and mastery of form. Robert could see no reason to suggest any changes. A great future lies before him, for when he comes to the point of writing for orchestra, then he will have found the true medium for his imagination." Unquote. Robert's diary entry that night was rather more abbreviated. Quote, Visit from Brahms, a genius. Unquote. Brahms stayed with the Schumanns for a full month and bonded with them like a wad of gum to the bottom of your high tops. Ever the helpy Helperton, Schumann contacted his publisher, the house of Breitkopf und Hertel, and saw to the publication of a number of Brahms's early works. But Schumann didn't stop there. As a music writer and critic of high repute, he came out of his self-imposed retirement as a journalist in order to write a little something about Brahms. Schumann's article, his Rhapsody on Brahms, appeared on October 28, 1853, in the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik. It is a long piece. We quote it in small part. I have thought, watching the path, that someone must and would appear, destined to give ideal presentation to the highest expression of the time, who would bring us his mastership springing forth like Minerva, fully armed from the head of Jove. And he is come, a young blood by whose cradle graces and heroes kept watch. He is called Johannes Brahms. 
His companions greet him on his first course through the world, where, perhaps, wounds may await him, but laurels and palms as well." Unquote. In his article, Robert Schumann declared Brahms to be nothing less than the savior of German music. Wow! Young Brahms must have swallowed really hard when he read that, going as he did, from a total unknown to being cast as the chosen one virtually overnight. No one had to tell Brahms that a certain Messiah did indeed receive laurels and palms, after which he was crucified. Brahms biographer Karl Geringer writes, quote, Instantly, the name of Brahms became known far beyond the limits of musical circles, and the publication of his works was eagerly awaited. One thing seemed already clear. It was not going to be plain sailing for the young composer. The public and the critics expected the very best after this sensational introduction." Unquote. Into the Drink on February 27, 1854, four months after the appearance of the article, Robert Schumann attempted suicide by jumping off the Dusseldorf Bridge into the frigid Rhine River. Suffering from tertiary syphilis, his mind had snapped. He was packed off to an asylum in nearby Endenisch, outside of Bonn, where he died two and a half years later never to return home or again see any of his soon-to-be seven children. Having heard the news about Schumann's suicide attempt and institutionalization, Brahms rushed to Dusseldorf, arriving there on March 3, 1854. He pledged to stay with Clara, who was five months pregnant, until her baby was born and Schumann had recovered. Clara was distraught. She wrote in her journal, quote, Either I cannot sleep at all, or else I lie half asleep, and horrible pictures hover before my eyes. I constantly see and hear him, unquote. Visitors to Clara and her children came and went, but it was Brahms who stayed, and by doing so became her lifeline during the terrible months and years that followed. Do I really have to tell you? Slowly, but inevitably, these two great artists fell in love with each other. As revealed in her diary, Clara's love for Brahms was idealized and essentially platonic. For example, on June 9, 1854, three months and a week after Schumann's institutionalization, Clara wrote, quote, I am learning to understand Johannes's rare and beautiful character better every day. There is something so fresh and soothing about him. He is often so childlike, and then again so full of the finest feelings. And as a musician, he is still more wonderful. He gives me as much pleasure as he possibly can, and he does this with a perseverance which is really touching." Unquote. But the post-adolescent Brahms's feelings for Clara were anything but platonic. In a letter to Joseph Joachim, Brahms made the following stunning confession, quote, I love her and am under her spell. I often have to restrain myself forcibly from just quietly putting my arms around her and even... Well, I don't know. It seems to me so natural that she could not misunderstand. I think I can no longer love an unmarried girl. At least I have quite forgotten about them. They only promise heaven while Clara shows it revealed to us." Unquote. Yeah, of this confession, Brahms biographer Jan Swafford writes, quote, the relatively calm tone of these words does not reflect what Brahms felt. 
Something great and terrible had happened to him in the months since Schumann's collapse. Johannes felt like Goethe's young Werther, living in an agony of frustrated desire. He wanted Schumann to get well. He wanted Schumann to die. He wanted to soar in the clouds, and he wanted to put a gun to his head. He had fallen helplessly in love with Clara Schumann." Unquote. Did Clara know how Brahms felt about her? Probably. But these were feelings neither Clara nor Johannes could possibly act upon while Robert was still alive. So Brahms, with no job or source of income, hung out at the Schumann house, longed for and daydreamed about Clara, played with the kids who were otherwise cared for by servants, read, and composed. Or at least, he tried to compose. But his feelings for Clara, the waiting, the children, his rootlessness, combined to create a feverish emotional pitch that was, for Brahms, not particularly conducive to composing. On top of that, the burden of Robert Schumann's article was coming home to roost. Brahms felt that he should be writing important, technically polished music. Instead, he had become all too aware of his compositional deficiencies, his lack of knowledge of advanced counterpoint and orchestration, for example, as well as the fact that he couldn't just write what he wanted to, unselfconsciously, without feeling the weight of the musical world on his slim shoulders. So even as he did his level best to console Clara and to come to grips with the huge expectations Schumann's article had placed on him, Brahms composed, working obsessively on a violent, angst-filled piece in D minor for two pianos, a piece that would eventually become his piano concerto number no. one in D minor, opus 15. A life of his own. By early 1856, the surrogate husband, stay-at-home father role Brahms had been playing at the Casa Schumann had pretty much run its course. The soon-to-be 23-year-old Brahms realized that he needed his own life. Circumstances forced the issue when, on July 29, 1856, Robert Schumann died. He was buried in Bonn two days later. The moment of truth for Clara and Johannes had arrived. Properly chaperoned, they took a trip together to Switzerland. We do not know what they said to each other or did with each other. What we know is that Brahms had already decided, despite all that they had shared over the last two and a half years, or perhaps because of it, that he could not stay with Clara. For his own emotional survival, Brahms had decided to take for himself his friend Joachim's personal motto, Frei aber einsam, lonely but free. According to Clara's daughter, Eugenie, quote, He broke away ruthlessly. My mother had suffered all the more as she could not understand the change in him. She remained towards Brahms what she had always been. She loved him truly and wholeheartedly. The admiration she felt for the artist was also bestowed on the man, unquote. We should note that Brahms and Clara remained the best of friends and continued to both love and torture each other for the next 40 years, until Clara's death in 1896. In October of 1856, the 23-year-old Brahms returned home to Hamburg. Brahms at 23 looked much like Brahms at 20. Small, blonde, high-voiced, completely lacking facial hair, wiry. But he had changed profoundly. He chain-smoked now, cigarettes and cigars, and he was bad-tempered, out of sorts, pretty much all the time. Emotionally, he had aged 20 years in the previous three, and he continued to slave away obsessively 
on his piano concerto number no. one in D minor. He had begun the work in 1854, soon after Schumann's leap into the Rhine River. Initially intended to be a sonata for two pianos, Brahms spent countless hours shaping and reshaping the piece, first into a symphony and finally into a piano concerto. Never having written for orchestra before, Brahms knew next to nothing about orchestration, and so he depended a great deal on the criticism and help of friends like Josef Joachim. According to the famed 20th century English musicologist Donald Francis Tovey, when Joachim saw Brahms's first draft of the concerto, he burst out laughing. We can be quite sure that he did not do this in Brahms's presence. By May of 1857, Brahms had more or less completed the concerto, though he continued to fuss with it for the next two years, until 1859. Why the fixation with this music? Well, first of all, Schumann's article. Brahms was terrified that if the concerto, as his first orchestral composition, was not as slick as Brill Cream on Patrick Stewart's head, he would be revealed as the compositional amateur he believed himself to be. Second, the concerto is the single most biographical and programmatic work Brahms ever composed, and he was having big problems balancing the emotional and descriptive content of the piece with its abstract formal structure. Regarding its programmatic content, for example, Brahms' Piano Concerto No. 1 begins with a harmonic leap quite as precipitous as Schumann's own into the Rhine. Despite the fact that the piece is advertised as being in D minor, it begins explosively, violently, and shockingly on a B-flat major chord in first inversion. The effect is both harmonically disorienting and expressively galvanizing, made doubly so by the thunderous timpani roll that underlies the opening. In fact, Brahms' Piano Concerto No. 1 is bound up entirely with his reaction to Schumann's suicide attempt, his profound feelings towards Robert and Clara, the years he spent with Clara and her children as both a surrogate husband and father, Robert's death, and his own decision that in the end he could not stay with Clara. No wonder he couldn't leave the piece alone. It was a virtual diary of his feelings, experiences, and musical growth from the time he met Robert and Clara in 1853 to the time he left Clara and moved back to Hamburg in 1856. As such, the concerto took on a terribly outsized degree of importance to Brahms. When we return in tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post, it will be with the so-so premiere performance of the concerto in Hanover, and then five days later, its utterly disastrous second performance in Leipzig. That Leipzig performance was a fiasco that would change Brahms's life and put a compositional monkey on his back that he would not shake off for decades. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.